Okay, so I'm going to assume you can all see that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so again, thank you so much for being here, everybody, for taking the time out of your day. I know things are crazy in many different ways at the moment, but uh, I appreciate you know the opportunity to come together with you today and and uh, talk a little bit about uh, managing fatigue and kidney disease and and um, you know how we can approach this uh, sort of challenging but very important topic uh, for our patients. So um, I thought I'd start just by spending a minute thinking about the significance of fatigue in the kidney disease population. So first of all, fatigue is the most common symptom experienced in uh, kidney disease and particularly end-stage kidney disease. It's been estimated that, for example, up to 70% of people on hemodialysis experience fatigue. And uh, not only is it common, but uh, it also really matters to patients. Um, so some of you might be familiar with the, uh, the Standardized Outcomes in Nephrology Initiative. Uh, and if not, this is a global research initiative that's uh, currently going on that's um, I'm working to identify the most important core outcomes to uh, include in future trials in nephrology, sort of worldwide. Um, and uh, 202 patients or caregivers and 700 and, uh, 979 clinicians from 73 different countries were engaged. Um, and they chose fatigue as one of four core outcomes to include in hemodialysis trials. In other studies, for example, here in Canada, fatigue has been chosen as a top three research priority of patients. Um, and in the US, patients have identified fatigue as the most important physical symptom to find better treatments for. Um, so really there's no question that uh, this is an important issue that we sort of need to figure out how to address uh, for and with our patients. So in terms of the characteristics of fatigue, um, we all, I think, have a good understanding of what fatigue is. It's a feeling of tiredness. Um, in kidney disease and in other chronic diseases, fatigue is often unusual, abnormal, or excessive. Um, and it's also disproportionate or even unrelated to a person's level of activity or exertion. Um, so it's primarily a difference in the frequency and degree of fatigue felt by people with kidney disease. Now, some efforts have been made to quantify this. Um, for example, uh, one study estimated that people on dialysis have about 50 to 70% of the exercise capacity of the expected norm. Um, and so that translates to an impact on 30 to 50% of the activity that they might otherwise be doing. And it turns out that this is the most problematic consequence of fatigue for patients. Um, so through the SONG initiative, um, the ability to participate in life activities was actually identified as the fundamental goal of treatment. And it was said that it symbolizes some indicator of being able to live a life without being confined by the disease. So I think this is a helpful perspective when we're thinking about sort of opportunities to intervene, um, because the, the objective becomes not just, you know, how do we make the fatigue kind of go away, but um, it's supporting patients in, in coping with fatigue so that they can participate more fully in their lives. And it gives us a sort of a, a broader set of options that we can kind of draw from. So beyond physical fatigue, there are also mental and emotional dimensions to fatigue in kidney disease as well. So for example, a lot of people report a decreased concentration, um, feeling especially tired uh, after doing some form of cognitive work. People also frequently report emotional stress and burnout as well. Um, so fatigue, I think, often encompasses these physical, mental, and emotional uh, domains in kidney disease. And then there's also the added dimension of post-dialysis fatigue, um, as particularly in patients on hemodialysis. So um, the vast majority of, of patients experience an increase in fatigue after a hemodialysis session. Um, almost 30% of patients have been estimated to take more than seven hours to recover from that. So um, post-dialysis fatigue is just another layer of the fatigue experience um, that uh, these patients uh, go through. So we've already sort of alluded to the uh, physical, psychological, and treatment-related aspects of fatigue in this population. And I think um, it can be helpful to break down potential causes in this way um, to start to think about you know, different intervention approaches that uh, could potentially make a difference. 
So starting with uh, some of the physiological factors, um, anemia, I think, is probably the most well-known and um, easy to identify cause of fatigue and kidney disease. It seems to be sort of the first go-to that uh, we think about when, uh, when someone reports fatigue. Um, there has been uh, some research to suggest that low-grade chronic uh, systemic inflammation, which is common in kidney disease and other uh, chronic diseases, um, is associated with fatigue as well. Um, there are other common complications of renal disease, of course, like uremia, malnutrition, hyperparathyroidism, um, and these complications have been uh, associated with fatigue in some studies, um, although the evidence is, is somewhat inconsistent on those particular factors. Um, there are medications commonly used in kidney disease as well, statins, uh, benzodiazepams, for example, that uh, can cause or exacerbate fatigue as well. Um, and then comorbidities of renal disease, heart disease, and diabetes, for example, um, are also associated with fatigue. So those are some of the, the physiological factors that are at play. Then we have uh, psychological or behavioral factors. Um, so first of all, mood disorders like depression and anxiety, um, I think are, are very common in this population and they are a major factor. Um, they are very strongly associated with fatigue, both in renal and non-renal populations. Um, common sleep disorders in kidney disease, um, like obstructive sleep apnea and restless leg syndrome uh, can exacerbate fatigue as well. Um, excessive use of substances like alcohol, marijuana, or other uh, types of drugs have been linked to uh, an increased risk of fatigue. And then physical inactivity as well. A lot of patients find it really difficult to stay physically active who have kidney disease, uh, ironically because of fatigue. Um, but this can unfortunately create sort of a, a negative reinforcement loop um, that actually causes further deconditioning over time and uh, can lead to then worsening fatigue. And then finally, we have uh, treatment-related factors. So we've talked briefly about uh, post-dialysis fatigue. It seems that, uh, you know, for example, the rapid fluid shifts and the hypotension that occur during hemodialysis um, can exacerbate fatigue. In terms of uh, dialysis modalities, in-center hemodialysis patients tend to experience the most severe fatigue. Um, although people on PD and in earlier stages of kidney disease also experience fatigue as well, um, of course, related to the other uh, non-dialysis specific factors that we just discussed. Um, a less frequent hemodialysis schedule is associated with greater fatigue. I think I skipped it, but also dialysis inadequacy um, has been linked to fatigue as well. And then I think it's also important to consider that um, the extensive responsibility that's involved in self-managing kidney disease and dialysis um, is another important treatment-related factor to consider. Um, when you think about you know, what dialysis patients um, have to sort of do on a day-to-day -day basis to manage their disease, you know, getting to and from dialysis sessions, planning complex meals, managing medications, monitoring fluid intake, um, these added responsibilities on top of you know, the things that we all have to do during a day are, are exhausting. Um, and so I think that's important to keep in mind as well when we think about what might be uh, playing into fatigue for this population. So moving on to thinking about um, assessing fatigue um, in the kidney disease population. So um, first of all, I think there are a few criteria to consider when selecting any type of patient reported questionnaire. So just to discuss those briefly, um, we should be looking for a questionnaire that's first of all feasible, of course. Um, questionnaire burden is uh, particularly heavy in these populations, especially in the dialysis populations. Um, so we're looking for something that's really, you know, as, as concise as it can be. Um, we want it to be validated um, and ideally in the kidney disease population so that we know that it's capturing the aspects of fatigue that are the most salient and the most important to um, this particular population. So, for example, as part of the, uh, the SONG um, HD fatigue initiative, um, the most important domains of fatigue that were identified in kidney disease were life participation, um, level of energy, and the ability to think clearly. So, we want a measure that captures uh, these particular important domains of fatigue. Um, we want a measure that has reliability data to show that it uh, you know, can perform consistently over time. Um, we also want a measure that has responsiveness data to show that it can uh, accurately capture changes in fatigue over time, particularly, particularly if we're looking to use um, the measure to assess outcomes or intervention outcomes or responses. 
Um, and we'd like a measure that is culturally accessible as well. So perhaps translated into a variety of different languages, ideally involving uh, groups from different cultures um, in the uh, creation or development of that measure to ensure that it uh, represents and can be used in a diverse patient population. So um, Ju and colleagues recently did a systematic review where they identified all of the measurement tools that have been used for fatigue in the hemodialysis research literature. Um, and they identified 45 different measures that have been used. So um, first of all, to note that there were some significant limitations um, across the board sort of that speak to really a need to improve the science of fatigue, uh, fatigue measurement in, in human disease. So, for example, 19 of the uh, the measures that were used were uh, developed and used without any formal validation process at all. Um, measures were often limited in the number of, of those relevant content areas that they covered. Uh, for example, only one third of the measures uh, that were identified did assess the impact on life participation, despite that being the most important part of fatigue for this population. Um, and then psychometric uh, research, uh, particular to kidney disease, was often either incomplete or missing altogether. For example, there were no, no measures that had uh, data on responsiveness. So again, that's kind of a problem in terms of um, measuring outcomes. However, despite these limitations, um, you know, we do have some, some measures that, uh, that we can still work with and that I think can give us, you know, a reasonable, um, you know, uh, or valuable information uh, about fatigue in our patients. So um, just to highlight a few of them, for example, the KDQOL 36 vitality subscale um, is a very brief measure, which is great. Um, and it does have some validity uh, data behind it as well. Um, and also covers some of those key content dimensions considered important to the population. Uh, the Childer Fatigue Scale is another one. It covers a lot of the key content dimensions that are important, um, although a drawback is that it lacks psychometric validation. Um, the Fatigue Severity Scale has both validity and reliability data, um, and it's quite brief as well, although it lacks sort of that breadth of key content dimension coverage. Um, and then we have measures like the Visual Analog Scale Fatigue and the Fukuda Fatigue Scale. Um, these measures are a bit lengthier, um, so that's the drawback there, but they do have, uh, you know, psychometric, psychometric data to support them, and they do cover a lot of those key content dimensions that are important. So uh, there are pros and cons to sort of all of the measures that are out there at the moment, but, um, you know, uh, there are still some, some relatively, um, you know, uh, reasonable options to choose from, and, um, and these measures can and should be employed to, you know, to help us assess and monitor fatigue in the patient population. Um, the good news is that the Song uh, group is also currently developing um, a, a dialysis specific, hemodialysis specific measure of fatigue um, that uh, the goal is to make it standardized, psychometrically sound and uh, validated in the hemodialysis population specifically. So um, this is what the measure look, looks like and it's very brief, so uh, convenient for patients and uh, you know, it, it engaged patients in its creation. So um, I think that's gonna be a great tool that uh, we'll be able to use in clinical practice practice and in clinical studies once it has sort of undergone that full process of validation. So now moving on to kind of the big question, which is, you know, what can we do to help patients uh, who present with fatigue? Um, and I'm going to break this down in, uh, in terms of strategies that uh, the patient can use to self-manage their own fatigue, um, strategies that the clinicians can use to help with fatigue management, um, and then strategies that family or caregivers can use as well to uh, support the patients as they're trying to manage fatigue. So starting with the patient's roles in uh, self-management of fatigue. So first of all, um, I think we can support patients in communicating with the people around them um, about fatigue to you know, make sure that everybody's on the same page and help them get the support that they need. So um, as an example, I know of a patient who said that she had uh, developed a sort of habit with her family of uh, ranking her daily energy level on a scale of one to 10 and writing that on the whiteboard every day in the kitchen. Uh, and this was a communication strategy that would sort of help the whole family plan for the day and set realis realistic expectations without her having to explicitly raise that because she found that a bit uncomfortable. So, um, you know, just generally ensuring that patients, family and support systems are on the same page or communicating and informed um, is a role that I think we can support patients in pursuing. 
Um, we can support patients in staying active and engaged. We know that this is an effective strategy for fatigue. So for example, in a systematic review that looked at the effects of exercise on a number of different outcomes, including exercise capacity, um, the results were significantly positive in favor of exercise, uh, you know, improving physical capacity in both non-dialysis and dialysis uh, kidney disease patients. So um, exercise, uh, from what we know, does seem to be an effective intervention for fatigue. However, I think the big challenge is that there are barriers to dialysis patients engaging in physical activity and exercise. Um, you know, for example, fatigue, a lack of interest, other symptoms like pain or fear of getting hurt um, are just some of the uh, many barriers that have been reported by this patient group to being able to exercise and be more physically active. So the question is, what can the average uh, clinician do to support patients in trying to be more active? So um, Johansson and colleagues came out with uh, a few, you know, simple, but I think really helpful suggestions. So first of all, we can ask patients about their physical activity level, help them identify what the barriers actually are, and just problem solve around those together. See if we can, see if we can help them to come up with some solutions that they may not have thought of themselves or may just not have even had the opportunity to think about themselves. Um, recommend increasing activity levels um, if levels are low. Um, and I think the really important key is to set small manageable goals. You know, I know that, you know, the recommended exercise uh, amounts for people are 30 minutes of moderate exercise, I think five times a week. Um, but that is going to be a deterrent for people who um, perhaps are really inactive at the moment. And it just seems overwhelming and unrealistic. And so um, the key is to set small manageable goals. Even just going for a 10 minute walk, um, you know, couple times a week is a great start if the person is, is not uh, active at the moment and sort of slowly increasing from there. Um, we can provide educational materials about exercising. There are a variety of good uh, written and video resources out there about exercise for this population. Um, even just using Dr. Google, you can find, um, you know, some web websites that will sort of, um, uh, you know, provide good resources for that. Um, and then if the patient is interested, referring to a trained rehabilitation professional as well, um, who can support them in undertaking more of a structured exercise program, for example, intradialytic exercise is available in some units. And so, um, so these are some of the things I think that we can do to support patients um, in managing fatigue with exercise. Um, we can help patients uh, to follow their diet. Um, I think, you know, following the diet is obviously helpful for preventing things like fluid overload, malnutrition, other symptoms that can co-occur and I think can contribute to fatigue. Um, we can also help them stay on top of their medications and their treatment regimens taking their medications as they're prescribed, getting to dialysis on time. Um, and if there might be challenges uh, interfering with this, for example, memory challenges, motivation related challenges, um, involving some sort of an allied health professional, a dietitian, an occupational therapist or a social worker um, can be helpful for addressing some of those barriers. We can support patients in managing stress and the emotional aspect of fatigue. Um, and I think, you know, that's gonna look different for different people, but uh, whether it's suggesting, you know, meditation, getting out of nature, reading a book, getting some social support from loved ones or from, from peers, from others with kidney disease, um, we can help patients to actively explore what could alleviate some of that stress of living with a chronic disease that might be contributing to the overall fatigue experience. Um, we can encourage patients to practice good sleep hygiene to improve the quality of their own sleep. So uh, some examples of some, some sort of self-management strategies that patients can use to help, um, help them get a better night's sleep include uh, limiting daytime naps to 30 minutes so that they're more tired by the time nighttime comes around. Um, avoiding any stimulants, especially close to bedtime, exercising during the day. Uh, we, can, we can sort of educate and emphasize that this will help to increase uh, their tiredness at night, and that's another benefit. Um, avoiding heavier rich foods before they sleep. Um, ensuring adequate exposure to natural light during the day, um, again, to you know, help sort of reinforce circadian rhythms and increase the feeling of tiredness at night. Um, and then establishing a regular relaxing bedtime routine and making the sleep environment as pleasant and peaceful as possible. For example, limiting screen time is, is something that we've all heard of before, but that can be, um, can be helpful for, for promoting sleep.
Um, we can support patients in reframing their thinking around fatigue. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is an example of a psychotherapy that can be used to help reduce some of the negative thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that um, often come with a physical symptom like fatigue so that the impact of that symptom is just not felt or um, uh, doesn't impact the patient quite as strongly as it otherwise would. Uh, the CBT approach to uh, physical symptoms like fatigue has actually been found to be effective in other populations. So, for example, um, a randomized controlled trial done in multiple sclerosis found um, that uh, cognitive behavioral therapy um, had the biggest reduction in fatigue over a six-month period when it was compared to um, control conditions, including inactive control. Um, and actually, there's a feasibility trial of CBT for renal fatigue uh, currently being conducted, I believe, in the UK. Um, and so that's going to give us, again, some more uh, really good sort of population specific information about, um, you know, the role that CBT might be able to play in fatigue management for our patients. And then finally, we can teach patients how to manage their day-to-day -day energy expenditure. And this is actually what my research is about. So I'll just spend a little bit more time here. So um, energy management, um, which we also sometimes call energy budgeting, it's a helpful sort of way to frame it for patients, um, is really about taking the same conscious approach to managing energy that we often do with managing our money. Um, and the goal of the approach is to optimize the use of a person's available energy, energy budget, if you will, um, to meet their own unique needs and goals and priorities. Um, and we can think about it, about it as figuring out how to live on a reduced energy budget. So just to give you a better sense of what this approach uh, sort of entails, um, these are seven core energy saving strategies that we often discuss uh, with patients. So um, first of all, eliminating tasks that aren't as important. So as an example, uh, setting up automated bill, bill payments with the bank um, or getting some help with grocery shopping so that the person can spend their energy on tasks or activities that might be more important to them or more meaningful to them. Uh, simplifying tasks. So for example, finding simpler recipes to make for dinner than the person is used to making. So, you know, small adjustments to a person's routine uh, that take them out of sort of the habits that they might be in and, and help them to identify, um, you know, uh, more manageable uh, habits that, again, free up some of their energy for other things. Um, using assistive tools that reduce energy expenditure. So for example, a food processor can be really helpful or uh, a tractor stool like the woman in this picture is using for her gardening um, can be really helpful. Um, organizing the home or work environment. So for example, organizing a room, a drawer, or even a closet um, to make it easier and more efficient to navigate um, and work within the spaces that the patient often finds themselves in can be helpful. Um, Encouraging the patient to ask for assistance with challenging parts of a task rather than maybe just not doing it at all. So, uh, for example, asking a partner or a family member to cook together or uh, asking for help carrying in the groceries if that's the most energy draining part of that task. Um, repositioning into a more energy efficient body posture. So for example, sitting on a stool while chopping the vegetables or sorting the laundry. I had a patient I worked with um, uh, in an energy management program who said that this was as simple as it was, this is the most life-changing strategy or change that she made um, after the program that it made a huge difference to her. Just, just getting used to sitting down doing things that she was otherwise used to standing um, while doing um, really had, had made a difference uh, to, to how she felt and what she was able to cope with. Um, and then slowing down and allowing enough time to complete things. So for example, breaking up the vacuuming and just doing one room per day rather than sort of taking on too much and then um, sort of crashing and, and, you know, finding oneself totally exhausted for the next, you know, 24 hours. So these are some of the energy uh, management strategies that we, uh, we often discuss with patients. So there is some evidence from other chronic disease populations that this approach uh, can be effective. So as part of my PhD research, I did a scoping review um, looking at all the evidence on energy management in chronic disease populations. 
Um, and the, the black boxes in this table are studies that reported positive findings associated with energy management. Um, and you know, just on first glance, you can see there are quite a number of black boxes in different domains, um, especially in fatigue, um, and also the impact of fatigue on various uh, domains of functioning. So um, nine of these studies were randomized controlled trials as well. Um, but unfortunately, there were no studies uh, on energy management and kidney disease. And when we looked at the literature, we also identified a few limitations um, in using some of the energy management programs that already existed um, in the kidney disease population. So for, for example, first of all, there was uh, limited evidence that energy management improved life partic participation specifically, which of course is the top priority for this population. Um, these interventions typically required a lot of staff involvement, um, which may or may not be feasible in, in certain dialysis environments. Sorry. And then um, the interventions themselves were often time consuming for patients and also often group based. So perhaps just not as flexible and convenient uh, to really support dialysis patients in being able to engage in these interventions. So um, in response to some of those gaps, I've been developing a structured energy management program uh, targeted at the dialysis population specifically. So the program is called the PEP program. Um, and it uses an individualized problem solving based approach um, to support people in figuring out how to use energy management to actually achieve their life participation goals. So the program involves three brief web modules and then four to six brief one on one session, sessions uh, with a clinician um, that are problem solving based and help people to find sort of personalized strategies to conserve their energy. Um, and I thought I'd show a quick clip for one of the modules so you can see what they look like. I'm not positive that this is going to work, but let's just see if it does. The audio isn't working so well. No? Okay. So you know what? We'll just skip it. That was an experiment. I really didn't know if that was going to work over Zoom, so my apologies for that. <laughs> um, but you can imagine what that what that sounded like, and those are at least some of the visuals from sort of what the what the modules kind of look like. But um, so um, we re uh, recently finished conducting a one to one, a blinded pilot randomized control trial of the PEP program. We compared it to an active control condition. Um, and our primary objective in that uh, pilot RCT was to explore the feasibility of uh, recruiting and retaining uh, patients for a full-scale randomized controlled trial. Um, and we also, of course, wanted to explore the effects of the program on both life participation and fatigue. So we recruited about 20% uh, of all English-speaking dialysis patients uh, from six dialysis units in Calgary, Canada to participate. Um, and in total, we randomized 30 patients um, and uh, retained 22 patients, so just over 70% uh, retainment rate. So in terms of some of our findings, so first of all, with respect to the life participation goals that people set, um, it's interesting to note that we found that these really vary and they cover a lot, they covered a lot of different areas of life. So about half were in the area of self-care or household management. But many goals were related to hobbies, recreation, and leisure as well. So I think sometimes we have a tendency to focus on disability um, with respect to personal care specifically. Um, but, uh, you know, I think these results kind of tell us that patients, um, you know, care more uh, about some of the other stuff as well um, than we sort of often consider and that they need support with some of these other life areas as well. Um, so just as an example of some of the goals that, uh, that patients set, so for example, I want to have enough energy to walk the dog three times a week. Um, I want to have enough, enough energy to cook dinner twice a week. I want to be able to shower without getting so exhausted. And I want to be able to go on a ski day with my family. So these were, these were specific goals that some of the patients set. And, um, and so we focused on these life activities, um, you know, um, and worked on those specifically with each individual patient, depending on what their priorities were. So the preliminary evidence from the pilot RCT uh, suggests that the approach was um, effective at improving life participation. So um, this graph shows that people who completed the PEP program uh, went on to achieve 40% of their goals immediately after the intervention, and that increased to 65% um, by three months after the intervention compared to just 20% um, in the control groups. 
Um, and in interviews, participants expressed a number of things. They expressed that the program had made their lives and everyday activities easier in some way. Um, many expressed that it gave them new ideas and strategies. Um, three participants described it word for word as being eye-opening. Um, patients were also positive about the goal-focused approach we took in the program. They really liked that it was personalized to their needs and their goals, um, and the program delivery format was said to be generally accessible and convenient as well. Um, there were challenges of, as well, of course. For example, some of the problem-solving strategies we, we provided to, were not well retained by the participants, perhaps due to sort of the, the abbreviated uh, format that we tried to provide those in. Um, and uh, several participants discussed the need to be motivated to participate as being a potential limit for engaging some patients as well. So certainly there are some strengths and also some areas for improvement uh, that were identified and we'll be looking to address those things as we move towards doing a, a larger study of the program's efficacy. So uh, in some, those are some of the ways that we, I think we can support patients in, again, self-managing their own fatigue and some of the uh, strategies that we can provide to, to them to support them in that. So now uh, moving on to thinking about the healthcare team's role in fatigue management. So first of all, the sort of low hanging fruit, we can treat anemia. Um, in the systematic review that looked at the impact of erythropoietin on fatigue, correcting hemoglobin levels led to a 35% reduction in fatigue. So addressing anemia is, is certainly uh, the go-to strategy and an evidence-based strategy for reducing fatigue uh, in patients who do have anemia. Um, we can think about minimizing polypharmacy. So we know that renal patients on average take about 12 different medications per day, I believe. Um, and some of those are potentially unnecessary. Um, again, we also know that some medications like statins, benzodiazepams, and other sleeping aids can contribute to fatigue. And so I think asking the pharmacist to do a medication review and a potentially a de-prescribing exercise um, to ensure, ensure there aren't any extraneous medications um, can be a constructive exercise if, if uh, fatigue is present. Um, we can review dialysis dosing and dialysis adequacy. Um, again, uh, you know, I think the hemodialysis process uh, can contribute to post-dialysis fatigue, which is sort of a worsening of fatigue that occurs um, just after the dialysis sessions. Although fatigue is always present, it seems to be worse uh, right after dialysis. And so, you know, considering longer, more frequent dialysis, if that is an option for patients. Um, we can monitor and address mood disorders like depression and anxiety. And I think this, again, is a really big factor. Um, we did a scoping review that found a lot of correlational evidence exists linking fatigue and depression in the hemodialysis population, um, including in uh, adjusted models. Um, although fatigue is a tricky side effect of depression to treat, particularly with antidepressants, it's often not as responsive to medications as some of the other symptoms of depression. Um, I still think the improvements in mood that, you know, can result um, can allow patients to engage in more activity and more exercise and so sort of tackle fatigue from that direction. And so um, targeting depression and anxiety is certainly something that we can and should do for a variety of reasons, of course, including fatigue management. Um, we can investigate sleep disorders from our angle. We know that uh, people with kidney disease are prone to a variety of sleep disorders, including sleep apnea, insomnia, excessive daytime sleepiness, and, and restless leg syndrome and periodic limb movement uh, disorders. So, you know, uh, assessing sleep quality um, and sleepiness and then introducing an appropriate intervention if necessary, whether that be a CPAP machine, medication, or lifestyle changes is, is something that we can do. Um, we can also uh, educate the patient about their roles in fatigue management. Again, sort of, um, you know, uh, taking the time to kind of discuss self-management and discuss some of the self-management strategies that the patient um, might be able to engage in themselves and providing the resources, the education or the connections or referrals, um, if that's appropriate to enable that self-management, I think is important. Um, we can provide uh, education and support to uh, caregivers as well about kidney disease and fatigue, um, you know, who can then make the patient's social environment that much more supportive and more conducive to fatigue management. And then finally, referring as necessary, again, referring to, you know, OTPT, social work, psychiatry, geriatric pathology, 
whatever team members you sort of have at your disposal who can you know, sort of provide some of those psychosocial or supportive interventions for fatigue management, um, I think is something important to consider when fatigue is present. And then finally, I just wanted to end up by touching on how we can support caregivers and helping with fatigue management as well. So again, similar to the patient, I think communication is, is very important and we can educate the caregiver, first of all, about fatigue. Um, I've had a lot of patients that I've worked with who, um, you know, who have been engaging in the PET program uh, energy management intervention with me who say, I really wish that my, my loved one, my husband, my wife, my kids could see this um, because, um, you know, they often feel that the, the family maybe doesn't have a, a, a good understanding of fatigue or how kidney disease contributes to fatigue. And so um, I think providing some of that education to, uh, to family um, can be helpful for everybody. Um, uh, you know, we can support the caregiver and also communicating, expressing their thoughts, feelings, and needs to um, kind of reduce under misunderstandings and just get everybody on the same page um, to reduce sort of stress or any tension that of course can kind of make everybody feel more tired. Um, following on that point, we can educate caregivers on how to be supportive and understanding in response to fatigue and um, what the patient's specific needs might actually be um, so that uh, again, everybody is sort of working together and, um, and on the same page. Um, we can help the patient and caregivers sort of re-examine or consider how they might be able to uh, rearrange their life roles, the responsibilities that they, um, you know, might be used to or normally take care of, just might need a little bit of reorganizing um, in the presence of kidney disease fatigue. So, um, and involving someone like a social worker or an occupational therapist can be helpful um, in supporting people in doing this. Um, and then we can support and encourage family members to engage in their own self-care and fatigue management as well. Um, caregivers and family are at a high risk of fatigue and burnout themselves. Um, I remember, I very well remember one caregiver uh, after I gave this talk about fatigue to sort of a patient group coming up to me and saying, I can't tell you how much I needed to hear about this from my own perspective because, you know, it's been exhausting. It's exhausting in the support role as well. So, um, you know, using some of the self-care strategies for patients that we talked about, you know, eating well, exercising, getting enough sleep, managing stress, I think is something that we can support care caregivers with that will also have an impact on the patient as well. So uh, in some, I think sort of the take home messages, um, if there are any, are that uh, fatigue is very common in kidney disease. Um, it matters a lot to our patients. Um, and we do have some tools available that we can use to, to start measuring and monitoring fatigue and kidney disease. And then there are a variety of different types of strategies that we can employ to manage fatigue and kidney disease. And I think it's, it's a symptom that is multidimensional and multifactorial. And so it really is best tackled from, from several different perspectives to sort of achieve the best outcomes. So again, I just wanna say thank you for having me. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, all the organizations and the people on the screen for their support uh, in my research. Um, and I would be happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Janine. Uh, I think very timely, uh, as I think all of us are, I'm sure as you're, you were giving a talk of all of us, we're reflecting on the things that we could do in our own lives to manage our own fatigue. But I think yeah. most importantly for our patients, I think we feel quite helpless um, often when they say we're exhausted, you know, like, well, you know, sorry about that. But so I think this has been really excellent. There was a question, very practical. How do we access that PET program? Yeah, great question. So um, it, I wish it was already available out there. It's not yet. Um, we're still sort of in the develop, development and refinement sort of process of it um, and just making sure that we've got it really down and um, uh, streamlined so that, you know, it's as efficient both for patients to use and for healthcare providers to provide as possible. So I think, you know, once we uh, sort of design and finish doing the, the, uh, the randomized control trial of the program, which we're planning to do, hopefully, um, that at that point, then we'll start engaging in some of the, um, the uh, promotional, I guess, sort of uh, exercises and getting it out there and available to people. So unfortunately, at the moment, it's not quite ready yet, but um, uh, I, I will be happy to keep everybody posted um, as soon as we sort of have that ready to go. 
That'd be great. There's another question. Yeah. Uh, this is exciting work. Thank you. I wonder if there's an uh, intention to look at the PEP program outside HEMO, for example, in PD patients or those approaching end stage looking at conservative care. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question as well. So um, absolutely. Um, we started in the hemodialysis population with our pilot RCT, um, just because we sort of had to start somewhere and, uh, you know, hemodialysis, they have the added, you know, post-dialysis fatigue. And so the burden is particularly large there. But actually in our preliminary testing, we involved a couple of patients on peritoneal dialysis as well. And um, we were looking at, um, you know, whether we could provide the program effectively um, uh, through sort of a, a purely uh, electronic format, which these days we're doing a lot of uh, anyway, but this was pre-COVID, um, and uh, and just seeing if that was feasible, um, and and so um, certainly I think um, it is definitely adaptable for other kidney disease populations. There's nothing about it particularly that is uh, really specific to hemodialysis, and so absolutely I think um, you know once we move move uh, you know past the sort of phase of testing specifically in hemodialysis, I think we would look to definitely to see see how well it works in other populations too. A few more questions, um, which mm -hmm. is great. Um, how to encourage long-term hemo patients for, um, to fight fatigue is, is one, which is, I suppose, curious. And the other one is corollary. Um, the assumption that implementing this requires dedicated and specialized personnel. So how do you do it in units where those dedicated resources don't exist? I think that is like, so the scalability of this in the absence of you know, educated and dedicated people like yeah. yourself, how do we actually get this out there? Yeah, absolutely. So that's like the existential question that I grapple with kind of, kind of every day as I'm trying to sort of figure out how to position this research. And I think it's, it's an interesting question. Um, and, you know, the answer that I've kind of started to give to this question is that, um, you know, I think, you know, there's a certain amount of, of adjusting and sort of, um, you know, uh, leveraging and sort of uh, designing that we can do to make these programs, um, you know, more feasible in, in uh, areas where pers dedicated personnel are not available. On the other hand, I also think that, you know, we're doing a lot of, you know, globally and in Canada, we're doing a lot of patient oriented and patient engagement research lately. And these are the issues that are coming to the forefront um, as we talk to our patients. These are the things that patients care about and these are the outcomes that, that they care about. And so, you know, if we know that some of these supportive interventions uh, can work and can be effective, I also think that there's sort of a, a larger resource issue to kind of be considered there and to say, you know, maybe the dedicated personnel are actually really important to, to kidney disease care and to hemodialysis care and that perhaps we need uh, to re-examine that because I think there's only so much um, condensing and uh, sort of uh, reorganizing we can do with these programs to make them um, available when there isn't somebody there to provide them. Um, and so I think um, without sacrificing their efficacy, right, and, and how effective they are. And so I think, you know, I think there's a broader question there as well to kind of grapple with. But from our perspective, we've, tr you know, we've been trying to, we're working on a training program for the PET program, for example, for people who don't have expertise in problem solving training and energy conservation and all that stuff to see if we can, um, if we can get sort of, uh, you know, for example, maybe you choose a dedicated person in a, in a hemodialysis unit one nurse or one somebody who who uh, becomes a sort of a uh, the champion of this program and kind of is the one who does that that's a potential uh, potential way to approach it but you know I think there's also a question of like maybe these resources are actually really important for patients so we need to rethink that too in terms of the question about uh, the long-term uh, patients I think that's a, it's a good question as well um, and it, you know, it can be a challenge. I think, you know, what we find is, you know, for some, some of the patients who have been on hemodialysis for a long time, they're just, you know, they're in the habit of, uh, of they've already sort of readjusted their lives. And sometimes it can be a big ask to ask them to sort of start to rethink how they're doing things and, you know, um, uh, set these big goals when already they've kind of already, um, in a sense, unfortunately, given up a lot of the stuff that maybe used to matter to them and their lives just don't look the same as they used to anymore. And, and they might not have you know, the really impetus or the energy even to kind of engage in some of that reorganization. So I think it's partially a timing um, issue. When do we provide a program like this? And can we do it sort of a little bit sooner when the patient, um, you know, uh, is still sort of new to hemodialysis, not right away, because it would be too overwhelming to be teaching everybody sort of 
um, all these strategies at once, right, when they're initiating dialysis. But I think, um, you know, doing that as soon as possible, um, you know, within maybe the first six months or the first year so that they kind of, um, you know, they've got it in before, um, before they've sort of uh, reached that point. Um, yeah. yeah. I like to take you back to, like, I think your answer about about, you know, this is important to patients, so we need to make it important to the team. But I, I wonder also if um, just even this talk has made me think about um, how much information we give people when we're giving dietary advice, like, can we make it, you know, less complicated when we're talking about med? Like, what can we do to, and if each of the healthcare team providers thinks about uh, energy conservation, energy budgeting, both in the instructions as well as the things, and that, that may be another way to to do this or to Absolutely. help the concept right so you kind of socialize the notion a little bit more for uh, sure yes yeah, so that it's embedded kind of in just sort of the overall ethos of the team yeah absolutely i think that's a great point too the whole team yeah um and the timing thing um selena was pointing out it is important right like when you do this um and if it's fundamentally the thing that they're most up, most concerned about, then maybe it is okay to do it sooner and we can leave some of the other stuff to later, right? Yeah, that's it too, exactly. And I think, you know, uh, my uh, my one of my mentors and my, my PhD supervisor, who's also an occupational therapist, you know, always says, she says it more poignantly than I do, but, you know, <laughs> allow people to kind of dream and set the goals that are really going to matter to them and really going to make a difference to them. Ask people, what do they really, really want to be able to do that they just do not do anymore? If you kind of start from that question, um, you know, I think sometimes the motivation follows, right? Like when it's really something that is, that is going to be so meaningful to an individual, I think sometimes, um, you know, even patients who maybe normally are not that engaged can so, kind of find um, find the motivation from that angle. And so um, I think that's the the beauty of kind of, you know, having this sort of personalized approach and, and it's the, it's how we kind of present it as well. Yeah. And I mean, I think that many people already are really, I mean, patient focused in that we try and organize um, yeah. additional meetings or medical um, treatments or something at the same day of dialysis or so they only come into the hospital yeah. once. I mean, those are little things, but I think it reminds us to really try hard um, yeah. um, to think because sometimes, yeah, whatever, like let, let them go to whatever other meeting they have to go to. But I think we probably should, should think a little bit more carefully about those sorts of things. Um, so there have been some questions. Any additional questions that people have in the audience? Roll. Well, we've we've now budgeted an extra ten minutes into our Friday. <laughs> so thank you for that. Thank you for the, uh, an excellent um, overview and a reminder that this is a science and an art, and it's part of our toolkit to help us take care of patients. Uh, and really reminds us to ask people what's important to them and not to just say, oh, well, I'm sorry that you're tired, your hemoglobin's okay, there's nothing more I can do, right? I think it makes us rethink um, our helplessness um, that we've come to, to have in this arena and, and really gives us some new energy to, to think about that. So I really very much appreciate not just the work that you're doing, but also sharing it. And I, what I failed to say at the beginning is that Janine actually presented this PEP and it was highlighted in the World Congress last week as something uh, very important for patients and for providers. And I think the systematic approach to solving or helping to solve a really important problem is really fantastic. So thank you. Oh, I just got an extra question just when I thought we had a um, two more questions. Um, and just lots of people thanking you for sharing, um, sharing your work and your population. So really, again, thank you on behalf of everybody and uh, very much appreciate the time in preparing this and, uh, and sharing it. So look forward to being able to access PEP. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> and thank you again for having me. It was, it was absolutely, it's always nice to be able to kind of connect with, with others who are sort of working or working directly with patients. Yeah, so thanks for being here. In your trial, I think you'd be keen to do that as well. Exactly, absolutely. Great. Okay, thanks again. Thank uh, you. Thanks to everybody for listening. Take care, Bye. everybody. Bye.